So this is about the time that normally I would say something like, on this show, we're going to be talking about capturing that precise moment. But here's the deal. I've got Pete Souza on my screen. So my guess is this conversation could go anywhere, and no matter where it goes, I think we're going to enjoy it. This is Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all those stories and challenges that happen in between. This episode, as with every episode, you can find the show notes and any links that we mention at BehindTheShot.tv. And by the way, uh, the show notes that I write, I write a little bit about each of my guests, and I did about Pete today as well. And then I've got a small gallery of their work so that you can kind of preview what they shoot. But I always have a link to their website, and I highly recommend, especially in today's case, but with any show, that you uh, head to their website, check it out, follow them on social media, et cetera. And today's going to be an easy one because he's actually the same handle on all social media. If you are watching on YouTube, I can't put the entire blog post there. There's a limit on space, but I do put all the links that we talk about. And uh, keep in mind, I've got chapter markers down there. So if you want to jump to you know any specific part, you can do that as well. If you want to follow me, that's fairly easy as well. I'm at stevebrazel.com or, of course, the podcast, behindtheshot.tv. And I'm at Steve Brazel everywhere. It's like the country of Brazil, but two L's, Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, doesn't matter where. Uh, feel free to jump on and give me a follow. And I, I try and answer any messages that I get you know, as well. So I want to jump to today's guest really quick. And, and I've got to do a little preface here. And we've been talking in the green room, and I've been enjoying the chat a lot. Since I started this show, which was back in December 2016, I've had some amazing guests on here. Some of them have been household names. There are those guests that I discovered because of the show that, that I follow now and I'm a big fan of. But here's the deal. When I started Behind the Shot, I had kind of an unwritten mental list of guests that someday I hoped to get on. Right, people like Joe McNally or Richard Horowitz or Dennis Reggie, uh, my buddy David Bergman, who will come up in conversation today. Uh, Christy Goodwin is a friend of mine now. David Hume Kennerly, I could go on and on. Rick Salmon, the people that I have wanted, Scott Kelby, Trey Radcliffe, et cetera, et cetera, that I wanted to get on this show. But today checks off one of those bucket list items. I'd like to welcome to the show, Mr. Pete Souza. Pete, how are you? I'm good, Steve. Thanks for having me on. It is my pleasure. We have met a couple of times. We'll we'll kind of touch on how we met uh, in a second. But for those that don't know you, this is how I describe you. Tell me where I'm right or wrong. <laughs> I consider you nowadays, the first thought that hits my head is a best-selling author because you don't have just one book. You have a lot of books out there. You're a speaker. You're a freelance photographer, and you're based out of Madison, Wisconsin. Did I miss anything? Uh, no, I'm happy with the way you described it. Okay. And the funny thing is, you are you are clearly photographer first, but you've become so prolific in, in the way that you utilize your photos long after they've been taken on social media, whatever, to convey your own point of view or your own message or whatever. And I kind of like the way that you found that meeting place between what's in your mind and the stories that your photos tell. We've met twice, and I've got to thank David Bergman before we move on. David Bergman is a mutual friend of ours, and during the pandemic, he started doing these Zoom hangouts for photographer friends. And uh, you've been in a couple of them that I've been in. For those that don't know you, I kind of want to do a quick glance through your career, because in researching you, there were some things I didn't know about you, and I, I thought I knew your career fairly well. You were a staff photographer at the Chicago Sun-Times, official photographer for President Reagan, freelance photographer for Nat Geo and some other publications. I did not know that you shot for Nat Geo. That's an interesting one to me. You were the national sh photographer at the Tribune, and you were part of the Tribune st staff that was awarded a Pulitzer in 2001. What runs through a person's mind when you, I mean, from a photography point of view, that's the pinnacle, right? What goes through Pete's mind when he gets the phone call that, hey, you won a Pulitzer? Well, I don't usually list that on my uh, bio, or if I do, it's kind of in passing because it was, a, it was a staff award. It was basically the entire staff of the Chicago Tribune 
that did a project on 24 hours um, with the airline industry. And my little piece of it was I went to the FAA control center outside of DC and spent the entire night with the top air traffic people uh, in this big, huge center. And, you know, my piece of the Pulitzer was very tiny, but, you know, I'm, <laughs> I was part of that staff and I'm proud of it. I have a little memento uh, just above my computer that the, the Pulitzer committee gave me. And, um, but it's not like, uh, you know, it, it's not like uh, I got the Pulitzer for photography or for photojournalism. So I kind of downplay it because um, it's it wasn't an individual award, or even a staff photo award. It was the entire staff of the Tribune. And my piece was very tiny. I, I completely understand what you mean. However, I would also add, knowing your work, there's no question in my mind what you did was an integral part of it. I, I, most people know you through the Obama administration. You were the chief White House photographer for... Uh, all eight years of the Obama administration. And I didn't realize until researching you, you were also in the International Photography Hall of Fame. So here's my question for you. You have accomplished so much in your career. Is there anything on your bucket list still? Um, I don't know if there's anything on my bucket list. I mean, I... I I say to people that I um, really like to go to Antarctica sometime. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, I was a one-man lobbying crew to try to get President Obama to go there so that I could go. Um, and you can just imagine the logistics of trying to get the President of the United States to Antarctica. Right. That would be almost impossible but i tried you know just <laughs> the photos of the president um, going through drake's passage would be worth it alone yeah yeah exactly um rick so i mean i'd sort of i you know in i think in my in my dream world i would i would like to go i'm just sort of fascinated with the photographs that come out of there and rick salmon look, does no a number Paul. of workshops there and his work coming from there is amazing yeah i just think it would be kind of uh, fun to do even though i hate cold weather <laughs> Um, but uh, you live in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah, I didn't say I liked it. I didn't like. The, I don't I like the that. winter here. You know, it's great when yeah, it's not the go- winter. But yeah, all right. Well, I will say you've recently posted some photos of uh, uh, Brandy Carlisle uh, in concert. So hopefully someday that will be your next your next gig as a tour photographer, uh, because even your live music photography is. Do you like doing live music photography? Um, I, I do. I mean, as we were talking earlier, there's, I mean, basically three bands that that uh, I'm friends with and have access to. And um, I like photographing those bands because I pretty much get all access. Um, and, um, you know, I'm making a pitch to to uh, the Springsteen folks to uh, let, let me do a show or two uh, on this current tour. I mean, I know Bruce a little bit, so I'm, you know, I think I'll get some access, but I don't, I don't like to do like, you know, the three song thing. It's sort of like, you know, Brandy is a friend of mine, the the Lumineers, and I have an Avid Brothers t-shirt on. Um, I, nice. I know, I know uh, uh, Bob Crawford, the, uh, the bass player and Joe Kwan, the cello player, they're friends of mine. So usually I get pretty good access. I shoot one of their shows. And you just did a thing with Danny Clinch, actually, uh, at his gallery. So there's that connection to to Bruce as well. You are, and, and actually, correct me if I'm wrong, the Danny Clinch thing was a speaking engagement, right? Yeah, originally, <laughs> originally, this was on part of my book tour. And I came up with the idea of having Danny um, host me. I thought it would be fun to do. And I'm a big fan of Danny's work. I know him a little bit. Um, so I just kind of like called him out of the blue and said, Hey, what do you think? Uh, would this be a good fit for your, you know, you and you at your gallery? And originally the idea was he was just going to do a Q and a with me. 
And I was fine with that. And it was like a few days before he said, why don't you just do your normal presentation? And then, uh, and then I'll ask you some questions after. So we kind of changed the format around at the last minute. And then a friend, another friend of mine, Adam Weiner, who is the lead singer of Low Cut Connie, uh, he, he's friends of mine, he's friends of Danny. He's texted me, he goes, hey, I see you're gonna be at Danny's gallery. What if I come by and play a few songs? And I was like, fine with me, you know? So that was kind of fun too. So like he, he was the, the uh, after I did my presentation, Adam did a couple songs and then Danny did the Q and A. So it was a really fun event. Big fan of Danny Clinch's and his harmonica playing actually. You, you've done your lectures at places like the Smithsonian Museum of American History, Carnegie Hall, Harvard, Facebook. I did not know you were Professor Emeritus of Visual Communications at Ohio University. I've got a question for you related to that. Where do you see visual communication five, 10 years from now? I mean, I'm the wrong person to ask. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, mostly now it's on online. Um, I don't want to say print is dead because it's not. There's still some great work that you see in print, whether it be National Geographic, New York Times, um, you know, some, uh, some other uh, magazines here and there, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, somebody smarter than me needs to answer that question. Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure who that it would even be. Uh, you are, you are an author that has put out some of literally my favorite books, uh, in 20, and, and I'm not saying that because you're here, I would tell anybody that. I mean, these are these are very, very well done books, and I have a lot of good photography books, right? In 2017, you did you did Dreams Big Dreams, or Dream Big Dreams. You also did Obama and Intimate Portrait, which the photo we're going to talk about today was in that one. 2018, you did Shade, A Tale of Two Presidents, which was really, really unique. I think and then in 2020, 2019. 2019, yeah, 2019. Okay. And then 2022, The West Wing and Beyond, What I Saw Inside the Presidency. And I happen to have that book right here. Um, again, I love a good photography book. Here's my question, though, for those that that don't own one of these books already and are, and are looking at them. And by the way, I should mention, people, you can buy these pretty much anywhere, right? Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, IndieBound. Pete's got a local bookstore mystery to me. But for those that, that don't own these books already, run through the quick differences between them. Well, Obama, An Intimate Portrait is uh, my, you know, look at the eight years of his presidency. It's a, it's a book about President Obama and what I saw. And it's, it's I put it together chronologically um, so you could sort of see what the flow of the presidency was like during those eight years. You see, you know, some of the historical moments, but also some of the little moments that happened that reveal so much about him as a human being. You see pictures with the family. And so it's a real behind the scenes look um, at his presidency from, from my eyes. The Shade book, um, you mentioned, you know, what, what I do with photographs on social media. When Trump was elected, uh, I started trolling him, if you will. And pretty much every time he would do something that was just like kind of crazy, I would post like a, a, a sort of counterpoint to that showing, you know, a normal photo of a president, meaning Barack Obama. And sometimes um, would uh, not necessarily reveal what I was, uh, why I was doing it. In other words, <laughs> I, I, I would, my captions were, were, I think pretty funny sometimes, but also kind of pointed. And you had to be paying attention to the news to know exactly what the counterpoint was. So, so many people would message me, would comment on my Instagram post. What did I miss? I'm going to have to Google what this is all about. And, you know, so it was, a, it was sort of a way to responding to, to what was going on with Trump. So it was a very different kind of uh, approach <laughs> to using... Uh, public domain photographs in, in that way. 
And it got to the point where it, it was getting so crazy that I finally went to my publisher and I said, I want to turn this into a book because I don't want people to forget how crazy this all is, you know? Um, and so in the book, it's essentially Trump's crazy tweet on the left and on the right was the counterpoint that I had done on Instagram. So it really tied it together in the book. Whereas if you went back and looked at Instagram, you might not know what the heck I was talking about. Such a great concept. And by the way, speaking of trolling, my buddy Alan Hess said to me to be sure to tell you he loves that you troll Ronnie Johnson, uh, uh, Jackson. Jackson, yeah. 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 Um, and then what about what about the, so the, the West, latest book? Yeah, The West Wing and Beyond was basically my COVID project where um, it was kind of a book that I had thought about doing. Um it's really a behind the scenes look of what I saw inside the presidency. Uh, and, it, and it features a lot of the people that you might not know about, whether it be the, the uh, Oval Office valets or um, the White House groundskeepers or the chefs. I mentioned the chefs in there, um, you know, the director of Oval, Oval Office operations, but then also some of the quirky things that I saw behind the scenes. And even though this, you, you can tell that's President Obama on the cover. He's not in the book at all. It's sort of everything away from um, uh, from him that I saw. Some things that he never saw. Um, that 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 part was interesting. Now I, I've got to bring one thing up because I still have this on my DVR. I liked it so much I kept it on the DVR. Based on your books, you were the subject of a documentary called The Way I See It. It was November 2020, and I've watched it a few times. What struck me about, first of all, if you haven't seen this kind of documentary, you got to go check it out, okay? But I'm struck by the way that show was structured together to tell the story, right? Did you participating in that? change how you view your own work either past or for that matter what you're going to shoot down the road did it did it change your mindset on your work the 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 film yeah I, i'm not sure i understand the question i mean well, did the 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 sh the show the way you see it having yeah. participated in that and diving I into see. your work in that way did it kind of change did you did you start looking at your own work differently in any way maybe not um, yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about it, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of right now in the process of trying to uh, organize my pre White House archive. And it's sort of a Herculean task. So I got, you know, lots of black and white negatives, color slides, color negatives, um, all before I made the switch to digital in the early 2000s, that I'm trying to you know, wrap my head around. And for the film, the way I see it, they, the, the producer's director wanted to feature some of my, you know, old work, if you will. And I didn't really get a chance to fully go through that archive, but I had, I had a few selects picked out, you know. Um, but I also, like, it made me remember um, some things that I had forgotten about. Um, like for instance, they wanted to know what was my first published photograph and I had forgotten, you know, really what it was. And I, I, it was like in 1976, there was this big celebration where the tall ships came to New York, but before they went to New York, they went to Newport, Rhode Island, which is only, you know, like 30 miles from, you know, where I lived in Massachusetts. Both my parents and, are from Newport actually. Yeah. And, and uh, my, my dad took me out on his boat so I could get some pictures of these tall ships. And of course we got in trouble because we weren't supposed to be that close to the ships <laughs> and stuff like that. But I got like, you know, several pictures in sailing magazine, you know, which to me was like a huge thing to, and, um, and I was telling this story to the, to the uh, uh, director uh, on it, you know, on camera. Um, and, and it was like kind of all coming back to me and they went, <laughs> I didn't have copies of the magazine. They went and found the magazine, you know. And so, um, 
so for that, it made me really think about, well, I need to, I really need to dive deep into my archive. I bet there's a, you know, a lot of gems in there that I just didn't realize I had at the, at the time that, you know, should, should be more prominent than they are. Um, and, and what exactly I exactly what I meant. Yeah, exactly what I meant. I read in an interview with you where you were talking about making versus taking a photo. You said the following. I want people to realize that there's actually some thought to my to the photographs that I make, that it's not just randomly shooting pictures. I'm out there actually thinking about my composition, my framing, when exactly to click the shutter, and that there's a thought process to it. I want to start with that. But away from you, keeping that in mind, when you look at somebody else's images, what moves you? I think what moves me is um, authenticity and emotion. You know, um, I think um, let's take recently. Um, uh, I think I was, uh, as, as probably most people were, moved by what was happening in Ukraine at the start of the war by the still photographs. You know, Lindsay Adario, uh, some of her photographs. Um, it, I think that gave a better sense more than any story of what was happening there. Um, and so, you know, I think I'm, I, I'm, I'm also moved by photographers that, uh, um, take a different look at, uh, sort of mundane subjects. Let's take the presidency, which, you know, for the most part, is pretty mundane in terms of what the press access is. Um, and there's, you know, there's some outstanding young photographers, including um, somebody that was a student of mine at Ohio University, um, uh, how they approach photographing these uh, sometimes, uh, you know, boring uh, events. Um, and so I'm always looking for, for photographs that, you know, people are, are uh, looking at things a little bit differently. You know, you have, you have captured iconic moments like this situation room photo, right? You've been there for things that most people won't get to photograph. And I, I, I think inherently that's, part of the job, obviously, of, of a White House photographer. There's a, there's a guy who listens to the show who tweeted something about Yochi uh, Akimoto, who was L, LBJ's photographer. I read an interview with David Hume Kennerly, who's actually been on the show before, where he referred to Oki, as they call him, uh, Godfather, the godfather of White House photography, and that his work, quote, made you understand the value of why there should be a White House photographer. Right. Basically, he said what he said to him, Oki told told Kennerly or uh, uh, supposedly. You've got to just be there all the time, 16 hours a day. That's how you're going to get the good pictures. Is there anything you would add to that? Having done it so many times in multiple administrations? No, I think that's a good way to put it. And I think not only is Okamoto, I, I consider Okamoto the first official White House photographer. I mean, people say, oh, it was Cecil Stoughton with Kennedy. But, um, you know, Cecil and Bob Knudsen, it was actually two of them that were military photographers assigned to the Kennedy White House. They had no previous uh, interaction with Kennedy. They were just basically assigned by the military to the White House. So their access was hit or miss, you know, it was depending on Kennedy or secretary pushing a button saying, come up to take a photo. Right. Whereas Okamoto, as you say, was all in. I mean, jo Johnson understood the importance of having somebody visually document his presidency. And I think he set the bar so high that I think we've all been trying to live up to that level of not only access, but um, the, the photographs that, that Okamoto came up with. And, it, and it's striking, actually, when you look at Kennedy, 
and the photos that we have of him doing the job or being in the White House. And then LBJ, the volume of what we have alone speaks to the access that he had. Well, I mean, if you go back, I mean, there's some like nice pictures of that Cecil Staten has of Kennedy, you know, with his kids. And, um, you know, of course, Cecil's the one who shot the famous photograph of LBJ being sworn in on Air Force One, which I consider the most famous official White House photograph ever. Uh, you know, thank, thankfully, Cecil was there and Cecil right. got the moment. Um, I think it reassured the nation, you know, that there was a peaceful transition of power from a president who just died to there's somebody still, you know, leading the country. It was an important photograph for that reason. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's vitally important to have a photographer on the inside documenting all those moments. I mean, but if you go back to the, let's take the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's very few still photographs of what was going on in those, what was it, 10 or 12 days? Right. Because, you know, Cecil and Bob Knudsen did not have that, that kind of access that like Kennerly had or I had or, or uh, you know, Okamoto had. Yeah, very interesting. So real quick, before we jump into the shot, I just want to remind everybody the show is a podcast first and foremost, and you can find this in an audio only format or a video format wherever you get your podcasts and all the links that you can subscribe to it as a podcast are on the website at BehindTheShot.tv. Of course, if you are watching on YouTube, if you head down below the like and subscribe button, you will find all the links we talk about there as well as the fact that they are on the website. Again, don't have the full blog post there, but any links that we mention will be there. Uh, Wherever you are, whether it be a thumbs up on YouTube or Apple Podcasts giving a, a five-star rating and a written review, it is very, very much appreciated. And uh, I thank you for all of all of the support you guys have given over the years. Before I pull this shot up, I, I was thinking about something as I was kind of assembling the scenes for this show. I'm assuming that a White House gig is work for hire, correct? The, the government owns the images you took? They're, they're public domain. So okay. they become public domain. So it's sort of like um, akin to the Farm Security Administration, you know, Dorothea right. Lang's photographs. So um, anybody can uh, use them for pretty much any purpose other than, you know, you've got to be careful about using the president's likeness in a way that is commercial. In other words, you know, I'm wearing a Patagonia sweater. So if the president's wearing a Patagonia sweater, Patagonia can't use the photograph to advertise, you know, their products. Without a model release, yeah. Well, yeah, or without his specific permission. Right. Where, but, I, you know, pretty much, because, like, people are always asking for photographs now. You know, they want to use it in a magazine or whatever. And I was like, in the, you know, and they want me to sign a license. I go, there's no license. This is, you can use the photograph, you know. It's, it's public domain. You can use it. Okay, that's that's good to know. So this shot, we went back and forth on what shot we were going to pick. Yeah. And you suggested one of the the two most iconic ones, either the Situation Room one that I showed earlier or this one here. The truth is I could do a show with you on any shot that's on your website, but this one kind of stuck out to me. Hair like mine. And this shot to me is is what I kind of want to see from an Oval Office shot, right? It's one of those more candid moments that happen. It's kind of what I want to do when I have all access to a band. I want to give the viewer that, that uh, I want to give the viewer the view they couldn't afford or, or get access to, right? I want to let them see the things that they either help them remember something or that they couldn't see on their own. And it's these, these intimate moments that I find so fascinating let, let's start for those that are really into the tech stuff with that. EXIF data showed this was a Canon 5D Mark II. Sound about right? Mm hmm Okay. And it shows that it was a EF50 1.2 manual mode, auto white balance, center weighted metering, <laughs> 1 over 100 at 2.8 with an ISO of 500. 
Does that all sound correct yeah. before I dive into the question I've got on that? Yeah. It, and, <laughs> um, yes. And I, I have a few things to say about that. Okay. Let's start yes. with your side then. <laughs> well, my side is why the hell was I using such a slow shutter speed? Um, Thank you. I, and I okay. think that, um, so here's my mentality. Here was, here was my mentality is that I was still of the mind that you could not use a high ISO on digital cameras. You know, I started with the old, what was it, DH1 or uh, on the Nikon side. And, you know, those were really terrible files. And you kind of had to shoot at 200 or 400. So um, I was still of that mentality that I had to keep my, my ISO slow because otherwise, low because otherwise the noise is going to be too much. And I think that this was a situation that I didn't know a moment like this was going to happen. I thought this was a, a normal, like a family's coming in for a quick photo standing in front of the desk. And so I'm trying to keep the quality, you know, so that it's not very noisy. Um, and then this happens. Um, and obviously <laughs> one one hundredth of a second is too slow of a shutter speed. And so I'm surprised it's as sharp as it is. Um, uh, so, you know, <laughs> if it was today, you know, I'd be shooting one two hundredth of a second. But anyway, um, it's a very slow shutter speed for that situation, no doubt. And and there's no flash according to the EXIF data. And no it's flash. interesting because a 5D Mark II, you could have done this at 1600 I so easily. Right, but I didn't know that. I, I This was early. You know, I, I started uh, the first month or so or maybe two months of the administration i was using my own uh cameras and i had the the 5d um and it took us a while to get you know the government at the, to to get us the the latest equipment which was the 5d mark ii at the time and so i was still of that mentality of the the, the, the original 5d I don't want to go too noisy. I can't use a high ISO. Um, that's just the way I was thinking at the time. So that answered one of my key questions, which was in a situation like this, I was surprised it was 2.8, but now I get it. You're limiting your ISO to 500. And even at 2.8, you could only get one 100th. So that makes sense to me. What doesn't, I'm not going to say it doesn't make sense to me. What I'm, what I'm confused on is Steve not being good <laughs> I would have walked in here with a 24 to 70 or something to that effect where I had some zoom. The fact that you chose a 1.250 prime yeah. is interesting to me. Was that just because it was on the body? Was there a reason for you going 50? Yeah. So I, I, I would, um, those, th that first year or two, when I was in the oval office, I would have a 30, a 35. Was that a one? I don't remember if that was a one, four or one, two. Um, but I have a 35 and I have a 50 and then somewhere in, either in my belt pocket, I would either have a 24 or a 135. So I was using all fixed lenses. And the reason is um, the first version of the Canon 24 to 70 to eight was not a sharp lens, especially at two eight. It was not sharp. It just was not there. Um, and I tried like three different lenses, like this, you know, three different, um, versions, not versions, but th three different Copies lenses. Of none, it, right? of them, none of them were sharp. They just were not sharp. And so I wasn't going to use those, um, because, you know, this is history and I didn't want to have like fuzzy, not sharp photos for, you know, the next hundred years or, or whatever. So that's why I was using fixed lenses. Now, why wasn't, why didn't I use a 35 at this moment instead of the 50? I can't tell you. I mean, I did okay. not know this was going to happen. Um, it's not really that great of a composition. You know, I've cut the dad's head off. Um, and uh, it, but it was like such a, it was like one of those moments that it happens and you either get it or you don't. I have one frame of this. Literally, there's one frame. I was not a motor drive kind of guy, but obviously, you know, you're shooting three frames a second or whatever it is. 
Uh, there is one frame. The frame before this, wow. the frame before this is uh, President Obama, upon hearing Jacob say to him that his friends had told him that his haircut was just like the president's. Upon hearing this, first frame, president's bending over, saying, go ahead and touch it. Second frame is this frame. Next frame is Jacob touching his own head. Wow. Those are, those are the three frames I have from that situation. And it was, there was so much going on because uh, uh, right, right after this photograph was made, he had another meeting with one of his speechwriters. And I never looked at the back of my camera. You know, I um, thought that I had gotten a shot and it was an interesting shot, but I hadn't really even looked at it. And I didn't even see the photograph until the end of the day. Uh, and even when I saw it, I remember saying one of the photo editors, Rick McKay, was the one, the first one to see it because he had downloaded my cards. And I think he sent it to me on my BlackBerry. I remember looking at it saying, man, my composition's bad. <laughs> <laughs> not, really, not really taking in that I had got the exact, you know, precise moment and what that would mean in, in uh, days and weeks and years to come. Because this picture really resonated with the African-American community, kids of color. You know, here's this young five or six-year-old African-American kid touching head, the head of the President of the United States that looks like him. And I did not realize in that moment uh, how people would view that, you know, that photograph. There's a magic in that, right? This is, you're right. This is the precise moment. It's shocking to me you only got one, one frame. frame of this. I mean, talk about, and it, what's shocking to me is, I mean, obviously you're busy as you're going around shooting, but still I would be thinking in my head, I need to know, I need to know. I'm, I'm so glad the editor sent you the shot, but I do have a question for you because I didn't know that. So somewhat similar to a festival photographer, you did not edit your own shots. You, they went to an editing staff. Oh, so what would happen is, um, things, things were, were, uh, somewhat different then in, in that the way we approach the behind the scenes photographs is we kind of had two outlets. One was Flickr. So every month on Flickr, We'd go through the previous month and pick out, you know, usually between 50 and 75 photographs, behind the scenes photographs, and post them on Flickr, you know, like a monthly. Uh, uh, like a roundup. Gallery, you know, basically. Um, and then we had started, like, probably just a month before this, uh, the photo editors said, what if we did like a photo of the day? and put it on the White House website. Um, and they would, um, th th there were two ways it would come about. One, it would be uh, the, the editors would go through, you know, the takes of b both my work and the other photographers that work for me. Um, uh, occasionally the vice presidents, uh, solo events, Michelle's solo events, and we'd, they would choose their favorites. And then I might say something to them, hey, uh, I shot this today. I think this is a good picture. And they would look for that. So this was Rick sending this to me. Hey, what about this one for a photo of the day? So that's sort of the, the way that came, came about. I was more involved in the, uh, in the Flickr um, upload of photographs. Um, I mean, ultimately I would decide which photograph was going to go out publicly, you know, that we would make public. And then I would, you know, in certain instances, make sure the press office was okay with it, but they kind of trusted me for the most part, but we like to have, you know, multiple eyes on a photograph just cause like, you never, you know, you just, uh, sometimes I'm, I wouldn't think about how somebody would react to a certain photograph. I don't know if that right. makes sense or not. Oh, it makes total sense. Makes total sense. If, if, for those of you that are running. You know, just to be clear, 
um, we were choosing myself and uh, what was the final art, you know, the final decision maker in terms of this is the photograph that we want to make public. It wasn't like the press office was going through all my photos and, and making decisions. You know, we, the professionals, meaning myself and the photo editors that worked for me, were making the decisions on choosing which photographs we wanted to make public. Okay. Yeah, that makes total sense. Now, for those of you that are on the audio feed, I'm going to try and describe this shot. The truth is, to me, there's a lot of little intricate details in this shot that matter. So if you're listening while you're driving the car, you keep in mind, you can always go to the website behind the shot.tv, click the picture, it'll blow up in a, in a light box and you can see the picture. But I'm going to try and describe it to you. I actually got an email today from somebody who said they drive, they listen to the audio version, they try and see if they have the picture of the image in their head from my description, they go look at it later. So let's see how good I do on this one. I'm, I'm not <laughs> feeling super confident. So Pete described this to me as an unexpected moment of an ordinary situation, but now is symbolic of the Obama presidency. And let me lay the, la the, the, the landscape here. You're standing in the Oval Office at the White House. You are clearly behind one of the well-known two couches that are kind of in the center of the room because you can see a little part of the couch and a little cushion that's there. The carpet, you can tell it's the round carpet. You see a small piece of the presidential seal. Camera right against the back wall is a small chest of drawers or dresser. On top of it is what looks like, I would say, a Remington statue of a horse rider with a lasso on a horse. The horse is rearing up, and above it, you see a part of one of the, the Oval Office paintings. You're facing the Resolute Desk, the famous desk in the Oval Office. It's slightly left of center, and behind it is the presidential flag and a table of photos, which is in front of those famous curved windows. Those, those go out to the Rose Garden, right? Uh, now, the Rose Garden would be to my left. So okay. that would be, I don't know, it's, it's kind of the south grounds. Um, okay. Beyond those windows? trees that you see, uh, you mm -hmm. see those trees out the window. So on the other side of those trees is the White House pool. Oh, interesting. Swimming I don't know that. All right. Swimming Speaking pool. of those trees, by the way. Through the windows, the trees, nothing outside the windows is blown out, right? Which a lot of people do when they're indoors, they blow out the outside. The trees are beautiful. Everything exposure-wise is kept in. And now let's get to the people. On the left-hand side of the frame, there are three people, an adult male, an adult female, and a younger uh, guy. And they're staggered in such a way that the younger guy is first, slightly in front of him is the adult male, and scooted out a little bit is the female. So you can actually see each one of those. The young man I would call a teen. He's in a white dress shirt. He's got glasses on. The adult male, as, as Pete mentioned, the head is out of frame. And then you have the adult female who is clearly smiling. All of them, the, all three of those people are facing the left rule of third. So they're to the left of the rule, and they're facing the rule of third. Center frame. From the right third is President Obama bending down at the waist with his hands in his pockets, which I love, completely back flat. And the question is, why is he bending down? It's because dead center right in front of the Resolute desk is this cute, small young man that is in the room in a nice white dress shirt, blue cargo pants, a red and blue tie, and he's reaching up and he is touching President Obama's hair. The timing here is, excuse me, the timing here is perfect. You can see the boy's eyes looking up at Obama's head. It is a one of a kind moment you could never recreate. The fact you got one frame, and in my opinion, nailed it. Amazing. Did I miss anything I should have pointed out? Uh, no, just uh, uh, let me add to that. So the boy's name is Jacob Philadelphia. Um, he was, I, I forget if he was five or six. Um, that's his older brother on the far left that you described. I think he's only nine. Uh, he, he, you know, um, and then that's uh, his dad uh, is Carlton Philadelphia. And that's his mom. I forget her name. 
So his dad worked for the national security staff, non-political staffer, was in the foreign service. And what they do is often they rotate in and out of those jobs. He had actually worked during the Bush administration as well and the beginning of the Obama administration. And his next posting was a foreign post. So the family was going to be overseas. And as a courtesy, uh, the president invited the family in for what was supposed to be just a quick picture. Hey, thank you for your service. Good luck, you know, in your next post. And I was going to take a quick photo of the family in front of the desk with the president. And that was it. That's why it was just kind of a routine thing. And then I think it was Jacob's mom said, well, Jacob has a question for you. And that's when he really said, it wasn't really a question, that his friends had told him that his haircut was was just like the president's. And President Obama bent over, like you see, and said, go ahead and touch it. So that's how that all came into place. And of course, this is like t- unexpected from my point of view. Didn't know this was going to happen. Very quick. Click, as I said, one frame. And it's, you know, my first reaction, as I said, when seeing the photograph was, man, my composition's not very good. Because like, I was trying to always get like the perfect moment, but also the perfect composition. I think I got the perfect moment. My composition is a little, you know, haphazard. But a lot of people say that's what helps make the photograph is that See, it's not I, really perfectly composed. I'm going to dive into composition later. I don't want to I, I don't want to go too deep now, but I have to say I agree with the other people. Because to me the the, the this is photojournalism effectively. You didn't expect this moment. You're standing there with a the camera, you capture a, a moment that unfolds in front of you, you get one frame. And in many ways, the fact that every it, the fact that even the composition with the head being cut off, everything draws you to Jacob. Everything mm-hmm. in this image draws you right to him. And I think if there were a, another face in there that was that high, you'd have so much window and wall behind them to get his head in that that would really affect the composition. I think this is spot on. There was something I saw on the website, by the way, about rotating pictures in the halls of the White House. Right? You, they changed yeah. them out? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So we had what we call these jumbos. They're 30 by 20 prints. Uh, we had these black frames. The prints were mounted on foam core. And they would be hanging in the, mostly the, the, the ground floor of the West Wing. And so um, I think there were two purposes for that. One, it was to, you know, there's like a thousand people that work for the president, but only very few of them get to see him every day. So it gave people a real good sense of what he, you know, what was really happening, you know, why they were working for him. And it gave them, you know, just a sense of mission to see him, you know, in action behind the scenes. And I, and I, you know, sort of changed the philosophy of those pictures in the sense that I think in some administrations there, it's more the ceremonial photographs, you know, state, rival state dinners you know and i wanted to really make it you know here's what's really going on behind the scenes give people a real behind the scenes look and you know people loved it uh and then at night you know uh every night from like uh i think it was seven o'clock p.m till 10 o'clock p.m the staff and secret service could give their friends and family tours of the west wing at night you know they'd get look at the old inside the Oval Office, the cabinet room, the Roosevelt room. But as they're walking in, they get to see all these pictures on the wall. Um, So we put this picture up. It was up for, you know, quite a while. And people would stop and kind of tell the story, meaning the staff people would tell the story. And I would, if if I was uh, still there, I would make sure they got the story right, you know, because I didn't want to, like, I thought the details of the story was important for people to know. And so it was a big highlight of those West Wing tours that people would stop in front of this photograph and the staff would tell their story to their family or their guests. Um, And then we kind of moved it around 
to different places in the West Wing. And, and finally, um, it caught the attention of a reporter from the New York Times that they would see all these photographs switched out and this, this one remained after two years. So she wrote a story about it. Um, and that was when it first got a lot of attention and they interviewed Jacob and his family and um, they were back in the DC area. Um, and then after about year five, I was like, okay, it's been up long enough. And I took the photograph down um, myself and put a different one up. And the next day, independently of each other, I had three senior staff people come to me and say, can you please put that picture back up? It's such a, a highlight of the West Wing tour that we miss not being able to stop in front of that picture and tell the story of, you know, Jacob touching the president's hair. So it went back up on the wall and it stayed there until, you know, we left on January 20th. Amazing. Amazing. And you did that. That's amazing. So there's a, on your website, when you, you talk about the different books, this image is in one of the sample pages that you've got there. And you said, I did manage to freeze the moment at just the precise second. And I agree. I think everything in this image draws you to that touch, right? Everything in this is about that special moment. How do you define a moment? And here, actually, a bigger question would be, can a perfect moment overcome flaws? In yes. The photo? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think for me, you know, my whole career has been... Um, trying to make pictures like this, trying to make moments, you know, pre precise moments. Um, if you can get the framing and the composition and the lighting really good, well, that helps as well. But, you know, for me, it's about making the moment. Um, and so I think, you know, this, this picture really is, um, how do you make a picture like this? You know, 30 years of experience being ready for, these moments, you got to be ready. And like you say, you can't, once it's gone, it's gone forever. And you either get it or you don't. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I probably always live for in, in my photography. Um, sometimes it's frustrating because like you, you will have days where you're, you think you're making great moments, but the reality is, you know, not much is really going on. <laughs> some days at the White House and, um, you know, you're doing a good job of documenting, but it's, you're not getting those really great moments because they just didn't happen that day. You know, so that's, that's the, uh, the, the, I think the patience of, of being a White House photographer too, is just, you're, you're always on, um, it, you know, uh, but, but the, the moments don't come, you know, every hour of every day. But right. when they do come, when they do come, you got to be ready for them. Uh, well, I applaud you because to me, this is spot on. I, I've got to touch on the composition because you've mentioned, and you say, by the way, in, in that snippet in the book that you have on your website, compositionally, the photograph is not ideal. We know the head being cut off, you've mentioned, right? But I'm looking at this shot and I'm seeing... They line up exactly on a rule of third. You have a rule of third here. You have a rule of third here, and you have a rule of third here. For those of you on the audio feed, I'm drawing on the screen. I apologize. Dead center is exactly what you want. The Even the statue landed at a perfect rule of thirds. I have the feeling if I threw the golden triangles on here, they may even fit. To me, this is, this is a master class in some ways, aside from the taller guy not being totally in frame, what else would you change here <laughs> compositionally? What, what else do you wish you had? Because I love this. Yeah, I don't know. I guess, you know, maybe it, 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 if I had been a, a, a foot more to the left, would it have been better? I don't know. Um, if I had been shooting with a, even though I, there's no such thing, if I had been shooting with a 45 millimeter or 
43 millimeter would have would it have been useful to have the painting that you don't see fully which is um norman rockwell photograph that steven spielberg had given the president clinton it's like the statue of liberty um would, would that have been better to have in there so what what if i had been um one inch lower you know um so the you know the president's nose is kind of touching the edge of the desk little things like that but you know you can't like it it is what it is it's i uh, mean yeah <laughs> it's just it's i'm sorry this is magic to me i love this you know, you, you've you been, I saw one interview where you said the Oval Office is one of the rooms where the lighting would change a lot because of those big yeah. windows and stuff. Yeah. The EXIF data shows no flash here, which makes no. sense, right? But I'm curious, did you ever use flash in a scene? The only time I would, no, I would, uh, the only time I would ever use a flash is if I was doing a, like a, uh, and, and it, I'll have to go and look, I don't remember. Uh, like if I'm doing a picture um, where they're standing in front of the desk and that's a quick posed photo, you know, looking at the camera. Right. I might use a flash fill because as you mentioned, those big windows behind, there's a lot of backlight, right. With, from those right. windows. And so I might pop a little flash in, uh, for that. But in terms of anything candid or meetings or I would never use a flash. Okay. Um, I probably I did not even use a flash for the, family photo is is my recollection but I, I i don't know for sure interesting would you have used ttl on the flash or, or manual on the flash uh i probably would have used ttl and then like minus you know something minus one okay. or something like that minus one and a half so um, i'll tell you one, one other funny thing about this photograph um that i didn't really notice until i was publishing my book um, so, um, we're getting proofs back from, from the printer when I was doing this book and the, um, the, the people that were proofing it with me from the publisher, they were being sent to New York. The proofs were circled the little white dot that you see on his pants and mm -hmm. say, and said, we're going to spot this out. And I was like, what is, what, wait, what is that? You know, and I wasn't even sure what it was. And if you go into that frame and you blow it up, it's like a little white button. Yep. And I, I was like, no. It. And they're like, well, it's really distracting. I go, no, you're not. You're not touching that up. That's not dust. That's part of the photograph. But it's funny that I didn't even noticed that. Now I can't stop looking at it. But it, I, I had never really noticed that what that was. See, and I noticed that, and I did zoom in and see that it was a button, but that that brings me to the question then. No, you're not removing that because it's part of the photo. Post-processing, when you're talking about anything journalistic or photojournalism, brings in the issue of journalistic integrity, right, and, yeah. and journalistic ethics. And we've seen news stories of major outlets having somebody post a photo and finding out later that they edited it in a way that is journalistically not ethical. And that the interesting thing to me there is there are somewhat standards, but every every outlet has kind of their own standards. I'm guessing you're more traditional on what your limits are, but what would you normally, when you took this photo and you went to actually process it, post-processing, what would you normally do to an image or what would you have done to this image? Yeah, I mean, I think we live by, you know, what were accepted journalistic practices. Um, I shot pretty much everything on auto white balance, especially in the Oval Office, because as I said to you, the light changes throughout the day. You got, you know, these overhead kind of like fluorescent lights. You got some incandescent lights on the, there's a couple of table lamps. You've got daylight coming in from many different windows. Um, so the light was always, <laughs> always different. And so I always shot auto white balance. So the first thing we would do is just um, maybe change uh, the color balance if it needed to be changed. Um, and then 
um, adjust highlights and shadows. And that was it. Do you crop? Um, it's funny because like I said to you, I don't want to crop this photo. Um, when, when, remember when you said you wanted it 16 or 16 by so, nine, I was like, I want people to see the full frame, you know? So what could we talking crop? about? Sure. Like you, you, you could, I mean, I had, that was one of the challenges in doing the documentary film, um, which was in a 16 by nine format. And it was challenging because they, the filmmakers wanted to go full screen. You go full screen, then you're topping, you're cropping either the bottom of the top or a little of both. And that was really frustrating to me. And so there were a couple of instances, this being one of the photographs where I was like, we are not cropping this photograph. You know, instead they ended up putting like black bars on the side. So um, it was full frame top to bottom, but on the, it, you know, it didn't extend the full 16 on the 16 by nine format. Um, but yeah, there were, there's no rules against, you know, cropping or not cropping, but you know, one of the advantages of having worked at National Geographic, well, I, I freelance for them. I was not on contract. You know, I did, um, uh, two assignments for the magazine and did, um, some book assignments where you're shooting color slide. And when you're projecting the images to the editor, there's no cropping. You're showing the way you framed it. Right. And so I became much more disciplined about framing my photographs. And so I kind of carried that through the rest of my career. And were there instances where we would crop? Yes. But for the most part, I, I told my staff that I didn't want to crop my photos. What, what Pete was talking about was, and those of you that watch on YouTube will understand this, during the show, I show the image like this, right? It's full full crop, but YouTube has posters and YouTube is video. And so the video is 69 and I usually do exactly that. I like all video people, I try and fill the frame with it. And then I put title text across the top of it. And so I asked my guest for a 69 and, and Pete was, no, I, I, I really can't crop this image. So when you see the poster on YouTube, you'll see the poster is uh, kind of like what you see now. It's kind of inset in a frame. The, obviously we're recording this, it's not live yet. And then on the right-hand side where you see Pete and I will be the title text of the show. And I, and I love that. And that's why I always ask is because I never want to modify somebody's photo. You captured, I heard, which kind of gave me chills in a little bit of fear, 1.9 million photos roughly in the Obama years? Yeah, that's right. What the hell does get, culling and to... storage look like for 109 million photos? Well, you know, we had a server that the White House maintained. And um, I, I, don't, I honestly don't even know where it was. I think it was in, you know, some bunker somewhere. Because um, all the president's emails and uh, right. were on the same server. Matter of fact, there was a time in uh, early in the administration when we had an earthquake in D.C. Um, president Obama happened to be on vacation in Martha's Vineyard. He was actually playing golf. I was with him and we were getting these reports about this, you know, earthquake and one of the military aides got ahead of himself and was telling people on the golf course that embassy buildings were collapsing and all this kind of stuff. So people were, people were calling, um, you know, their families, make sure everybody was all right. And the first thing I did was call the tech guy in my office and say, is the server okay? <laughs> Because <laughs> like all, all I could think about was, oh my God, what if you know we lost all our photos? Well, I just have to tell you, I love this shot. I love all of your work, but this was a fantastic pick for for dissecting. I, I want to kind of close out with some listener questions. I posted on Twitter that I was going to have you on the show. And a couple of people, it was interesting to me. I got a lot of questions back. I can't do all of them. But I th think three or four people had effectively the exact same question, just worded differently. Andre Adet, who's from Canada, longtime listener of the show, said he's captured so many iconic images. My question is, I'm wondering if he can talk about iconic moments that perhaps he missed 
or failed to capture and the lessons learned from those missed shots. And then Jonathan Yost, uh, Yost of Christmas Future, he goes by, also somebody I used to work with in photography, said, was there ever a shot that would have been amazing but was out of focus? So kind of the same content, you know, concept there. And then Will Byington, who I met also through the David Bergman hangout. Yeah, I know Will. I know Will. Uh, Will said, for the probably millions of shots taken and so many epic moments captured perfectly, are there any photos he missed, any that got away that he remembers wishing he'd gotten, but he missed? So all three of those kind of relate to what'd you miss? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure there were some I missed, you know, especially because of the kind of photography that I do, which is you know, you're, you're, you're trying to get the moment. Um, and you know, what if I had been a little off on this photograph, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have just spent the last hour talking about it. Right. Fortunately, I don't know that there were any, um, like that. I'm sure throughout my career, I've missed some photographs, especially in the, in the days when I was shooting sports and, um, there was no such thing as autofocus. And you're, you know, you're trying to manually focus at a football game or something like that. I, I think there, I think I had some frustrating moments then where, you know, the player jumps up in the air or whatever, and you're not quite sharp. And, you know, that was kind of agonizing to me at times. Although I got pretty good at sports. If you're doing it all the time, it's, it's, you, you get in a groove. Um, I remember when I was with the Tribune and I wasn't shooting any sports because I was based in D.C. They had me cover the the Bears came to D.C. and they had me cover the football game. And it was not pretty. <laughs> my take. <laughs> I There's one of my was, favorite shots. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's like, you know, because if you're not if you're not doing this is again before the days of autofocus. If you're not doing sports all the time, as you know, Bergman could relate to you before autofocus if you're not doing it all the time it's hard to you know get every every single frame and focus oh yeah Manu you know, this is back in the days of manually focusing and one of my favorite shots one of my wife's favorite shots that i've ever taken was of the band corn and it's jonathan davis on stage and it's a moment in between where he's arms wide and he's looking at the crowd and smiling and i missed my focus yeah. and i still love the shot it's still one of my favorite shots, but it haunts me to this day. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. all, all I needed was focus on that. Right. That's, and yeah. I'd love it. Um, Shado asked, and this is an interesting one. Actually, he asked two questions. I'm going to, I'm going to reverse them though. You know, everybody always debates. Do you go with a giant CF card, CF express SD, whatever, or do you go with small ones and change them out? Do you have a preferred size for your cards? Well, I mean, right now I'm using uh, 64. Okay. And then, that's, and that's a sand disc. It looks like, and uh, yeah. And he asked this other question, irrespective of brand, forgetting you know whether it be Nikon or Fuji or Sony or Canon or whatever. Two DSLR bodies, two lenses. What what is your body of choice today? And if you could only pick two lenses to carry on you, let's say you had a double rapid strap and a camera on each side, what's your go to lenses? Um. So I may have the R five. I'm using the R5. I've got two of them. Um, it, yeah, usually, um, my main photographic subject is, you know, my granddaughters now. And so um, I'm actually usually would, would only have one lens with me. So I usually either have 24 to 70, 28, the RF, and the, and the 50. Um, one, two. Um, and I'm waiting for these primes to come out. You know, supposedly there's a 24, a 28, and a 35 RF coming out. So I'm going to get one of those. I don't know which one, but uh, um, so I guess if I, if I was going to carry two, I would carry probably the 24 to 70. And on the other one, I still might have the 50 because I, you know, if you're in a low light situation, or if I'm outside, I'll take the 70 to 200 F4. As See, for me, one. it's the trilogy, it's the trinity of lenses, the 70 to 200 to 8, 24 to 70 to 8, and the 15 to 35 RF 2.8 is a wonderful lens for live music. I, I love that lens. 
And, and I liked the 16 to 35 before that. All right. So let's switch gears. Speed round. Answer these as fast as you want to. What is your top photojournalism tip? Uh, it, it show up. Oh, I like that one. You know, because Big, like, if you don't show up, you're definitely not going to make any pictures. Also, good. Show, show up early. Now, that one is one I preach all the time. Mm-hmm. If you're going to a show, get there early, get, you know, for a lot of different reasons, actually. Biggest yeah. photo mistake you have made or almost made? Uh, biggest photo mistake probably I've made is uh, there was <laughs> this, this is going back to the Reagan administration. Maybe this is this is the picture I missed, I guess. Um, you know, things were different then. Like it's sort of like we didn't have kind of this uh, the same access that like I have with President Obama. Mm-hmm. With like with President Obama, I just hung out the entire day. Like I'd be if I wasn't in the Oval Office, I'd be sitting right outside the Oval Office. But with President Reagan, it was sort of like we would cover certain, you know, events. And then I remember I was sitting in my office and his secretary called me and said, he's out in the Rose Garden throwing a baseball um, because he's going to throw the opening pitch at the Baltimore Orioles game the next day or something. So he's out there. So I run from my office, which was just below the Oval Office in the ground floor, run outside of the Rose Garden, and here he is in his suit coat throwing a baseball. And I'm like, this is awesome, you know, making this frame, that frame, this frame, that frame. And um, and he goes back inside, and I look down, and I realize I had never put film in the camera. Right? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest you know, biggest mistake I made. I never made that mistake again, but, you know, lesson learned. Favorite composition rule if you have one? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know that I have, I mean, I know all the composition rules and I, 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 I guess the only one that I, I really pay attention to um occasionally is rule of thirds usually when it involves you know if i'm doing like landscape or nature photos i'm kind of paying attention to that rule probably more than any other um but it's sort of like for me composition is like you know it you know it when you see it it's like you know i i i i know the rules and i probably break them all the time but I'm just trying to, you know, pay more attention to foreground and background and try to get, you know, it, it, cool things in the background um, while I'm concentrating on the moment in the foreground, that kind of thing. Favorite source of inspiration? Um. Boy, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I think it was, I think Rick Salmon the other day on your podcast was talking about masterclass. Um, and I was, I was uh, actually just last night was watching uh, Annie Leibovitz, um, her uh, masterclass. It was really interesting, I thought, like, because um, her photography is so completely different than mine. And yet, uh, listening to her, um, you know, I think that we're, <laughs> we, we have sort of the same attitude towards photography and the, you know, the importance of it and the, the, but in terms of inspiration, I don't know, I guess maybe music. Oh, I like that actually. And Annie Leibowitz is somebody I need to get on the show actually at some point in time. I need to, to find a way to do that. Favorite, speaking of music, favorite band or performer? Uh, well, I'll, I'll do a, th- a trio, I guess, you know, uh, Brandy Carlisle, she's a, a good friend of mine, Bruce Springsteen and, uh, the Lumineers, um, all, all bands that I like and, uh, know, I guess, um, I, I go the longest back to Bruce. The first time I saw Bruce was 1978 
um, and have been a you know huge fan ever since. Probably have seen I don't know thirty or forty shows over the years. That's one, and and I'm in music, and Bruce is my generation, and I've never seen Bruce live, and I I've heard all the stories. I someday I'm going to make that happen. Last one on the speed round. What's your favorite drink? Um, you know, I don't uh, drink that much other than uh, red wine and, uh, you know, occasional beer. Uh, and I don't know, for some reason, I went out for a beer the other the other day with uh, my friend Jeff Zeleny that works for CNN. I used to work with him at the Tribune. Uh, and he was in town on the heels of President Biden's visit. Um, and we went out and had a beer and I got a porter. So I kind of like the dark beer, I guess. Nice, nice. I'm I'm a whiskey fan or a Diet Coke fan for me. And last but not least, is there a photographer out there that you think more people need to know about and should follow? Um There's so many. There's so many and 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 um there's there's a lot of uh, uh, young photographers that uh, are really doing great work. Um, I, I hesitate to name just one because that's absolutely uh, fine. Yeah, absolutely. Just, fine. Uh, I, let's let's. Here's what I would say: If you go to my Instagram site, just Pete Souza, and you hit see who I'm following. You'll see the photographers that, you know, um, that I follow them for a reason, you know, uh, either they're friends of mine or they're people that I've never met that inspire me. Um, That's a good way to look at it, actually. Head to, to at Pete Souza on Instagram and anybody he's following, take a look. Same. It's at Pete Souza on Twitter. And it's PeteSouza.com. Those links are in the description on YouTube. And of course, they're also in the show notes at BehindTheShot.tv. Last but not least, your books are available where? Uh, I mean, pretty much anywhere. Uh, I, you know, I think that um, certainly Amazon, you know, which is where most people buy books. But also a big shout out to the independent bookstores in your city. Um as I was saying to you, one thing about photo books is to ensure that you're getting a pristine copy. If you do go to your independent bookstore, you're, you're, you have a much better chance of getting a pristine copy. Um, you, you might pay a little bit more than you would on Amazon, but you know, Amazon shipping, they just throw the book in a box and oftentimes the when it's a heavy book, especially Obama and Intimate Portrait, sometimes those corners get get bent. Well, I had one come the other day. It was, you know, like a tight package and it was just big enough to fit in the slot of my mailbox. So they forced it in there. And when I'm one of those weird OCD kind of people and it was dinged on the corners, it kind of bugged me. So I totally understand. Pete, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to do this. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Is it is absolutely my pleasure. Again, everybody, you can go to behindtheshot.tv. You can find a little bit that I wrote about Pete, all the links that we talked about, small gallery of his work. And you can do that for any show that you're watching. And of course, on YouTube, down below the like and subscribe buttons, you'll find the description and all the links are down there. Wherever you get this show, please leave a thumbs up, five star rating, you know, whatever it is that, that, you know, you feel uh, written comments are, are well appreciated too. And I started something on the last show that I'm going to try and keep going for a while. A lot of people know that I'm into whiskey and I find a lot of other photographers that I know are into whiskey. So at the end of each show, just kind of for fun, uh, I'm making a whiskey pick. And this time around, I'm going to do this bottle here, which is, I don't know if I can get it to focus, but I will try. It's a Jack Daniels special release for 2021. This is not a normal Jack Daniels bottle. It's a rare one. There's only 37,000 of these is my understanding. It's called the Coy Hill High Proof. It varies anywhere from 138 to 148, 
Mine's 140.1. It's only got a $70 retail on it, but you won't find it for that. It's like 600 on the secondary market. But I will tell you, it's one of the most complex whiskeys I have ever had. And uh, it is it is a good bottle. Again, Pete Souza, thank you so much for doing this. And to everybody that supports this show, you are very, very much appreciated. Make sure you join us next time as we take a look inside a photographer's mind by taking a closer look behind the shot. 